Hi, good afternoon. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a neurosurgeon, so I do the operations. And I think one of the, um, the things I always emphasize when talking about uh, these conditions that I treat with these uh, basically brain pacemakers is uh, my role in the, uh, the team and my role in uh, your journey is, is pretty discreet. And um, I, to really have the best outcomes with this therapy really requires being under the care of the right uh, neurologist. Uh, so the role of the movement disorder specialist uh, can't be overstated, right? And it, it's, it's their uh, management, both in terms of considering all options, Botox, uh, medications, uh, alternatives and diagnosis, right? And making sure that this is an appropriate diagnosis and their experience that they have a good uh, uh, feeling that neuromodulation, deep brain stimulation might be appropriate. Um, so the patient selection is really in the hands of the neurologist and movement disorder specialists are trained to kind of tease out uh, alternative diagnoses that might not be as amenable uh, to these kind of therapies. And my role is really to make sure that this, uh, this uh, therapy is implanted safely uh, and accurately. <clears throat> uh, I've come to kind of describe this more as a, uh, an electrical therapy uh, for conditions like Parkinson's, dystonias, uh, rather than a surgical treatment. You know, you don't come out of surgery with your condition fixed. Like if you have a, you know, bad ba a disc in your back, right? You take out the disc, that condition's fixed. The surgery is just the beginning, and it's the it's back in the hands of the neurologist that the pacemaker, which I'll talk about a little bit more, is activated and programmed, and the condition is, is controlled uh, in, that, in that manner. So it's really an electrical therapy for the neurologist, and they need a trusty, reliable surgeon to do the operation safely and accurately. So that's kind of my role, uh, and I'm gonna kind of uh, hit upon that theme uh, as, as we go through this. Uh, so this, uh, we use, I do DBS like four to six times a week, uh, I treat about 175 new patients a year for, uh, and usually it's Parkinson's and uh, essential tremor. I'll talk about dystonia and how we kind of fit blepharospasm and mesh syndrome uh, within that category. Uh, but it, it is an operation that is, um, in the context of what we do, is not a treatment of last resort. So the, when we talk about an operation, we could think about like, you know, what, what's the safety of the operation? What are the alternatives? Uh, what are the indications? What are the risks? Uh, you know, it, it, it's gotta be safe. You know, we, we, we always talk about risks. And uh, if the risks are too high, it doesn't matter how good the benefits are, no one's gonna sign up for this, right? And it's not like there's a tumor that we have to take out. So people elect for this uh, based upon the recommendations of their neurologist and their own personal preference. So this is a surgery for quality of life. And so the stakes are very high in terms of uh, provide, you know, wanting to get you in, get you out, get you back in the game uh, with, with minimal risk. Uh, the goal is to restore function and basically the way I can see if we did a, our job is if a patient six months after surgery says my life is better, I would do this again. Um, so always swing for the fences uh, with this. So I'll give a little historical perspective of this uh, therapy uh, that I'm describing, uh, talk about the indications and describe how it's done. Uh, again, we're, we're over 200,000 patients now if people have been treated worldwide. This has been around since the late 1980s. Uh, so this is not futuristic, it's not new, and again, I think in the past eight years, we've gone from considering this as, a, as an intervention that's a treatment of last resort to something that we can use a little bit more, uh, a little earlier in the, in the, in the condition. So um, the, why, why do we do things like this? Um, kind of goes back to like accidental discoveries in, uh, in medicine. Uh, back in the early days of the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, uh, the same person, James Parkinson, who diagnosed Parkinson, came up with a description of Parkinson's, noticed that a patient who had a stroke uh, that affected his entire hemisphere stopped shaking on that side of the body. And that was kind of like the first aha moment of like, maybe there's a role for surgery to treat movement disorders. And uh, that approach refined during the 1900s and uh, to, instead of doing major operations, they just stick a little wire and essentially cook the brain. This is a brain MRI. You can see the eyeballs and the nose in the upper right. Uh, so that's an MRI of the brain. And that circle right there is a, is a lesion. You know, like if you think about uh, heart conditions, right? A heart arrhythmia, uh, a patient may have an, an abnormal heart rhythm, right? And they can take medication for that. Uh, they can have an ablation, right? A, an electrophysiologist can go and ablate that area, a cardiologist and then they can get a pacemaker, right? So those are different options, right, to treat these abnormal heart rhythms. 
And we find that there's various conditions of the brain, Parkinson's, dystonias, and again, the, the, the mechanism by which these, uh, uh, these muscular disorders uh, appear actually are central, they, they, they arise in the brain. And so we can disrupt these circuits in the brain uh, through these lesions. Uh, so the origin of deep brain stimulation goes back to the era of lesions where they would treat movement disorders by creating uh, a little stroke just in the right spot. Patients would have to be awake for this uh, because you'd want to check, double check, triple check if it was the right spot, that there's no side effects, that you're getting the benefit because you can't undo a stroke. Uh, but this is an ablation. So you kind of think of just like I described about the heart with the brain, you can do medications, uh, you can do an ablation, this is an ablation, and you can do a pacemaker. And this was the first pacemaker that was used uh, for the heart back in 1958, right? Everybody knows what a pacemaker is now. Back then, it was kind of something weird and new. Uh, and there's the first patient who underwent a, a, pa a cardiac pacemaker. And what we have today is a pacemaker uh, for the brain. So um, very similar, uh, in fact, it goes in the chest, just like the, um, uh, the heart pacemaker, but the wires go underneath the skin, uh, up to little holes behind the forehead uh, through which the electrodes go into the brain, and basically goes into the, taps into the circuit uh, for movement uh, that, that goes awry with, uh, with conditions uh, such as uh, dystonias. So again, it's been around since 1986. It was FDA approved in the United States in 1997. So the, the track record here is that it's a safe, non-destructive, reversible, and adjustable uh, therapy. So it's not what you see is what you get. Because of technology, you can actually kind of fine tune this. In fact, in the setting of dystonias, like Mez syndrome, like blood first spasms, it's not like they turn it on and you see everything melt away immediately. If somebody has an action tremor, that tremor disappears as soon as you turn the thing on. There's different conditions that have, have different what we call latencies, meaning delay of response to the therapy. And in the case of these uh, conditions, it's usually uh, delayed by, by um, uh, it can be days, sometimes weeks. So we kind of see a, a buildup of benefit over the course of months. So this is what we uh, have approval for by the FDA. So the FDA says, oh, we like the evidence, you can do this. And you can see dystonia, right, which is kind of where we would fit uh, uh, Mesh syndrome, uh, blood first spasm under, uh, has an approval mechanism by the FDA. And that was done in 2003. It's called a humanitarian device exemption. It's HDE. And HDE is basically when a condition is uh, rare enough that they can't launch full blown, multi centered, randomized, blinded trials uh, that they do uh, to really vet uh, pharmaceuticals, you know, medications. This is where, like, okay, we have enough data to suggest that there's a benefit and it won't be feasible to run a full-blown clinical trial, so they have this humanitarian device exemption mechanism by which we're permitted to do a deep brain stimulation for dystonia. Uh, this is what the FDA describes as their approval for dystonia. Uh, it approves DBS for primary dystonia, including generalized and or segmental dystonia, hemidystonia, and cervical dystonia, torticollis, in patients seven years of age or above. Uh, so that's kind of where we're able to fit uh, uh, blood first spasm uh, Mesh syndrome, uh, and the focal dystonia is if it only affects one part of the body. Segmental is if it affects multiple parts, often in close proximity to each other. Uh, this is what we think of uh, in neurosurgery when we think about dystonia in neurology. Uh, this is a generalized dystonia, uh, which affects most or all of the body. Here are just some definitions. Focal dystonia, lo localized to a specific part of the body, and segmental would be two or more adjacent parts of the body. So if you have eyes and mouth affected, that would be a, a segmental dystonia, for example. So it's been around, there's, re, uh, there's uh, exclusion criteria, right? So some people may have uh, uh, cerebral palsy from birth, and they may have an associated dystonia. That would be considered what we call a secondary dystonia, meaning that uh, an injury resulted in the dystonia. Uh, so it's key when considering this therapy for these conditions is that, um, it's spontaneous, that it kind of just arose out of nowhere. That's good. Uh, if it looks like it was uh, because somebody had a stroke and they developed uh, uh, these, these movement disorders, uh, less likelihood that, uh, that DBS would help with that. Uh, so I'll show a video of what it looks like. Uh, this is a patient with uh, general dystonia. So there's actually genes uh, that are uh, associated uh, with Uh, that, that, that are associated with this. DYT1 is a gene, 
If somebody has that, it basically sets you up for a home run in terms of how DBS will help. Uh, again, you look at these muscular uh, symptoms and you think this is like a peripheral condition, but all of this is being driven uh, by abnormal activity in the brain. Uh, and obviously, you can imagine if you've had this condition long enough, a lot of these uh, muscles and the skeletal aspect can be kind of fixed. Uh, where you can get developed like permanent scoliosis. So this is after DBS, and you can see them. Uh, you can imagine all the calories he was burning beforehand, so he's able to put on some weight. And it's just, it's, it's, uh, uh, th these, it's not subtle. You know, people don't sign up for brain surgery for a subtle improvement. Uh, it's, it, and it really requires a team. Again, the neurologist is key to uh, uh, determining whether this is an appropriate next step. So... So there's the, that's what dystonia looks like. And there's class one evidence, meaning like they've really kind of gone through the process of not telling the patient if it's on or off, you know, which we call you know, blinded, blinding and randomization uh, to demonstrate that uh, deep brain stimulation has an, an impact on dystonias. And you can see kind of the scope of approval by the FDA where it's not just limited to genetics. That you don't need a genetic dystonia in order to be a candidate for this. So uh, blepharospasm uh, is, the most, uh, is the second most uh, common focal dystonia uh, after cervical. So cervical dystonia is uh, torticollis, and then comes uh, uh, blepharospasm. Uh, as you know, it's uh, excessive contraction of the uh, uh, eye muscles and adjacent muscles. And MES syndrome is when you have that in conjunction with oromandibular uh, dystonia. Uh, we've also, and I I'm going to describe, uh, I think repetition is good. You get, get the point. Uh, I've got, I do a lot of cases like this with Dr. Evidente. Uh, who just spoke before lunch, uh, and we often are, end up speaking back to back. So any redundancy will be kind of diluted by having had a lunch break. Uh, but um, <laughs> but uh, we've uh, he's been a great partner. He likes to write, and we get these papers published online. Unfortunately, uh, actually the um, uh, the papers that he's published uh, that we've uh, participated together on are open access. They're they're free online. You don't need a subscription. Uh, so if you look up, you know, Ponce Evidente, blepharospasm, uh, the resources that come up are actually uh, available at a click. You don't need to log in. Uh, there have been about 88 patients uh, th that have been uh, described in publications with blepharospasm uh, who have undergone deep brain stimulation. Uh, 57 years is the mean. So unlike uh, these primary dystonias, the genetic dystonias, which are often uh, older children or younger adults, uh, you know, th this is the more adult population. And, uh, and most of these had more than one dystonic symptom, which kind of fits that category of segmental dystonia. Again, we're kind of, we're not doing this. We actually use deep brain stimulation for other conditions. We have a phase three trial studying this brain pacemaker for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, there have been phase three trials looking at it for uh, uh, major depression. Uh, so, and, and there's a number of uh, off-label uses uh, Tourette's syndrome is treated with, uh, with deep brain stimulation. There's a lot of work being done looking at it for obesity and, um, and, and uh, addiction. Uh, so there's, there's, it's a wide open field because so much disease uh, originates with abnormal circuitry in the brain. And if it's an abnormal circuit in the brain, it means it, it's amenable to kind of this rewiring. Uh, so uh, the good news is in the context of today that this, this fits within that labeling that the FDA uh, offers. So this is one of our patients with Dr. Uh, Evidente. You can see up here, this is the actual case report. And uh, I, I believe you saw this video. Uh, but again, a, a gentleman who ended up having uh, uh, blepharospasm uh, as a result of medications that he was taking uh, for a psychiatric condition. And again, just two and a half years, the, the benefits persist. And, um, and it seems like they just get better over time uh, with this. It's a, and that's characteristic of dystonia. That was a, a video. And this other lady that I think you saw earlier. Uh, and this one, we actually treated her uh, with, a, with not the dystonia target. We use a, a tremor target for her, uh, the ventral intermediate nucleus, which is what we use for uh, action tremor. And, uh, and she responded very well. Uh, and I believe you guys saw this video as well. Uh, so these are just two examples that these videos are actually online uh, as part of these, these papers that we published. So. Um, so the key to good DBS outcomes, uh, again, it's, it can't be overemphasized. Uh, good patient selection, and uh, if somebody just shows up in my office and says, hey, I want surgery with you, 
I want a neurologist to have vetted the patient, a movement disorder specialist. Uh, that's really important. And that way, too, it sets the expectations appropriately, and you kind of know, all right, we've tried all these things, and I think that uh, even if the neurologist were to say, I've got nothing else to offer, I still want them on board with me as we take that next step towards surgery. Uh, again, it's, it, my focus is really delivering this therapy safely and accurately because it really is, it's not the surgery, it's the programming, it's the uh, electrical therapy afterwards. And there it is at the, the third point, good programming, uh, critical to good outcomes. So uh, how, do we, how do we make this accessible to patients, right? Um, so before uh, 2012, uh, we knew that the, we, had, we had the evidence. So this was, I came into practice in 2011. We had the evidence that this, this, you know, we could make little holes, we could put electrodes, and we could put these pacemakers in the chest, uh, and we could do it safely, and that was effective. But uh, to do this, check, double check, triple check that the uh, surgeon's in the right spot, you know, we borrowed the techniques for placing these electrodes from the era of ablations, right, where, you know, you can't unring that bell. Now, if, if, for example, an electrode is in the wrong spot in the brain, we, we don't want to take you back to surgery, but we can, and we can reposition the electrode if needed. Um, it's not, we, we haven't, we can't, uh, we, we can unring that bell. Uh, but it took a long time back in the day to find the right spot, so patients had to be awake. Many surgeons would only treat one side at a time because of the time commitment, and patients would just get tired. So by the time you finally find the right spot on the left side, when it's time to move on to the right, the patients had it. They're fed up. They're like, you know what? I'm done. Let's get out of here. So, um, so that was pre-2012. And so when I, when I got into practice, uh, that was kind of what I was looking at was a very effective therapy, but it was like the roller coaster, right? You had to really put your sign up for, you, you have to bite off a lot in order to get that on board. So this is what it looks like, uh, placing uh, the, the stereotactic frame on a patient. They're awake there. You know, keep in mind that these um, uh, therapies arose in an era before we had good MRI imaging and before we had real detailed understanding of the uh, cellular activity of the brain, the brain uh, electrophysiology and circuitry. Um, so they had to be awake and uh, they would get an MRI and then you'll see here that once you pick a target and plan the operation uh, using the patient's anatomy, then we still keep, uh, this is the, this is, uh, usually I show this before lunch. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so there's the, the surgical part and setting up the electrode and you can see the patient here uh, awake as the electrode goes in doing tests, making sure the right spot uh, has been reached. So, um, uh, so this is a self-select group, right? Uh, it's like, you know, if, if you need knee surgery, I think most people get to a point, they're like, just do it. Uh, but something like this, there's a lot of patients who stand to benefit who are like, thanks, but no thanks, not for me. And, and I think that's a reality, no matter how uh, easy we make the operation, that at the, at the end of the day, uh, having to be awake and having to have some, you know, knowing somebody's gonna to be touching your brain is a big deal. Uh, so this was before we had good MRIs. You can see this, this image over here uh, on the right. That's an that's a, that's a atlas of the brain. So 50 years ago, kind of our atlas of the brain comes from like three cadaver heads in France from 50, you know, 60 years ago now that they dissected. And they said, all right, in the ballpark, if you go you know, 12 millimeters this way, two millimeters down, you know, you're going to be in, in the right spot, you're going to be in the, the vicinity, and then you use the wake patient to refine that. So what we have now, this is on the right, that's a cadaver. On the left, that's an MRI. So you see these stripes? We have beautiful imaging that really shows with ex exquisite detail uh, the anatomy of the brain. And we can couple that with decades of uh, experience doing this operation to say, look, we know where we want to be on the brain, on the MRI, and our job is just to place it there accurately. So we don't need that crutch as much as we used to of having a patient awake in surgery uh, to uh, have optimal outcomes. So uh, we combine that with, uh, so direct targeting is where we use the MRI, and we can use the decades of data to pick that spot. And that's combined with uh, the inc increasing ubiquity of portable CT scanners. Uh, so in the past uh, 15 years, we've seen just a flood. In the United States, it's going to be in the United States, uh, where uh, Spine surgery is basically uh, done with an intraoperative CT scanner. So that what an intraoperative CT scanner allows for is to basically have a GPS system of the body during surgery. So there's no like you know mastery of being able to like feel around, and be like, all right, I think this is the right spot. Uh, you can actually see it on a screen, uh, and that guides uh, the placement of spine hardware. So I'm sure I'm, I'm sure some of you 
have had spine hard hardware put in place. If it's in your low back, uh, chances are uh, image guidance was used. And, um, and so for the brain, we get to piggyback on this. And so we've piggybacked on a lot of these technologies uh, because of how common spine surgery is. And one of those is intraoperative CT scanners. So in the United States, almost every hospital has intraoperative CT scanners. And what that means for DBS is we don't have to predict, uh, you know, based upon you know, this, the, how the patient's uh, response and the, the recording of their cells and their shaking, I think we're probably in the right spot. We can actually get a picture at the time of surgery and combine the picture. This is the DBS electrode, one, two, three, four. It spans one centimeter. We can visualize that using that intraoperative CT scanner as soon as we place the electrode and compare that to the surrounding brain on the MRI that we obtained beforehand to say, you know what, we're in the right spot, no doubt, right? So, uh, so that combination of, uh, there's the air, you know, half a millimeter off, so we know uh, where we are at the time of surgery, allows us to combine advanced MRI imaging with intraoperative CT to be able to do this operation with patients under anesthesia. Really takes a lot of the guesswork, a lot of the interpretation, uh, you know, thinking on your feet, right? I mean, it's like, again, if you, if you get your knee repaired, you're not thinking, a surgeon's gonna have to think on his feet, her feet, you know, it's like, that, that you kind of expect when you sign up for elective surgery that it's been grooved to the point that, you know, you just kind of get in, get out, and the same thing, the established uh, operation's been done. That's really been my goal with DBS surgery, is to kind of take some of the guesswork out. I've said, you know, we've had decades of research and learning about the brain, but I think we're prime time now that we're kind of taking some of the, the scientific investigation out and just delivering a solid product. So why do people uh, hem and haw about having an operation, right? Imagine if you had 0% risk, 0% you know, inconvenience, you know, like it doesn't take a ton out of your day, you don't have to go to these, all these appointments. Would you reach 100% adoption, right? You say, all right, it's proven. This therapy will help you. There's absolutely no risk, and you don't even have to, you know, take time out of your busy schedule for it. You know, that'd be great, right? It doesn't exist. <laughs> There's no such thing. Uh, but, but that's kind of, you know, that would be kind of the balance of like absurd risk, no risk. Uh, so patients all balance, the, and their neurologist and the surgeon balance risk versus benefits, the fear, the sense of self, right? After an operation like this, you can feel the device underneath your skin. You know, you got a pacemaker in the chest, you can feel bumps underneath your scalp. So um, what I've been looking at over the past 11 years, my job is to find how to deliver this proven electrical therapy in a way that minimizes the risk associated. And that is really accomplished through, through standardization, right? Uh, generalizability, that the same thing I do with my hands can be done with any set of hand, anybody as long as they're well-trained and they know what the steps are. Uh, so we don't want that bell curve in surgery where some people make it, some people don't. You know, win some and lose some. No, that, that's not good for elective surgery. Uh, we want to kind of narrow that scope so that we have very consistent outcomes both in terms of sur uh, safety as well as in terms of, uh, of functional outcome, right? Six months after surgery being like, all right, you know, the symptoms I came in with are, are, have been relieved. So, uh, so that's how the surgery has changed. Um, there's been a lot of advances in terms of the, the technology as well. Uh, we have three companies. Only one of the three companies is approved for dystonia, and that's Medtronic. So we can na name them because they're the only game in town when it comes to dystonias. But really what happens once we implant the system, again, it goes back in the hands of the neurologist, and that's programming, right, activating the, the device. Uh, the, um, so Elon Musk, right, from uh, you know, uh, uh, Tesla, right, he actually has a brain machine interface company. So he's, he, he's put a lot of thought into like, this whole thing. And, uh, and basically where we are right now is uh, today we're kind of in the area where you know, the cathode ray tubes, TVs, where it starts going off, you just hit it on the side. Like, that's, what he said, that's what he said we are right now with DBS. Deep brain stimulation is like you know, hitting the TV box so that the, the screen comes back into place. And uh, where we re really are going now is kind of advancing to the next phase where we can speak the language of the brain, we can use information about where the electrode is, we can actually, with the new Medtronic system, we can record the activity within the brain to really know what we're doing without the guesswork. And uh, that's gonna lead to the next phase where we just have uh, intelligent pacemakers that know exactly what to do, uh, put the neurologist out of business, right, in terms of the programming, where the, it just senses the brain and knows where to go uh, to obtain the control uh, and give uh, the symptoms. So uh, DBS is an option for blepharospasm. Uh, 
Mo recommendation by a movement disorder specialist is critical, right? It's, it, they're the gatekeepers, right? Uh, we're just exiting this hit the TV to make it work era and advances in technology open the door for smarter and more efficient programming through advanced control and understanding of patients' symptoms. Thank you very much.